about politicians. It's not about Republicans or Democrats. It is about the American people rising up against the global special interests that have taken over our country. They don't want to go back to normal. They want a new normal where you own nothing and you have no privacy and you have no rights and you have no dignity and we have no humanity and we have no freedom. Don't let anybody tell you that things have to be this way in this country. I thought to myself those simple words that we read in the Bible. What is impossible becomes possible through Jesus Christ. The power of the politicians backed by the giant corporations. And they've got the mainstream media. And they've got big tech. And they've got the billions and trillions of the world. And the banks. And Hollywood. And academia. And it seems like that is a pretty rough uphill climb. And I said this on Saturday, and I'll say it today, and I'll say it every day. They are woefully outnumbered. We have God on our side. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. It's great to be here back on the stage at the second America First Political Action Conference. I said this earlier, this is the final and climactic end to the conference, the moment you've all been waiting for. The final speech which I will be giving. Now, I have to tell you for this momentous occasion. For the first time, I wrote out my speech. Seven pages. But I've been sitting at my table all night and I think that's just not how we do things. Is it okay? Have I abandoned this speech? And I'll just talk from the heart like I always do, because that's how this started. Michelle made me a little bit insecure. Every year, she kills it. She comes up on the stage, and she knocks it out of the park. And I'm very good at doing the show. <laughs> but those speeches, I was crying last year, and I was crying a little bit this year. so. I typed it up, but I said, you know what? We've got to do it the America First way, which is live. America First is live. So that's how I'm going to do it. So I want to start by saying that, honestly, I never thought that we would get this far. And frankly, I think that not a lot of other people thought that we would get this far either, maybe people in this room. But 
This has always been the vision and the promise of America First from the very beginning. It was earlier this month that my show celebrated its fourth anniversary, four years that I've been hosting a little internet show, thank you, <laughs> called America First. And the premise was simple. Donald Trump had been elected, Donald Trump had been inaugurated, and it seemed like all of the energy and all of the, what made Trump different from the conservative establishment was sort of up for grabs. I know that I became a Trump supporter and campaigned for Trump and became involved in the election because Donald Trump was saying things that nobody else was saying. Very much unlike John McCain and unlike Mitt Romney and really unlike anybody else in the conservative space, Donald Trump was talking about globalism. Donald Trump said to Jeb Bush that the Iraq war was a mistake. He said that George W. Bush led us to war in Iraq knowing that there were no WMDs. He said that we, need to, we needed to build a physical wall between the United States of America and Mexico. It was something that was truly unprecedented, and in a time of unprecedented problems, what is required is radical change. What is required is a different way of looking at things, and that's what Trump provided. And so my show came around four years ago in order to protect and be a vanguard for that legacy. It was called America First because when I thought about the problems in America and the solutions, the only way that I could think about it was in terms of globalism versus nationalism. That we have this country and a regime that sits on top of it. And the people that are in the regime are not looking out for the interests and the well-being and the welfare of the people in the country. They're not putting the people first. And so America First encapsulated that new distinction, that the conflict facing our country was not between mainstream conservatism and mainstream liberalism. It was between nationalism with populism against globalism. It was the people and the grassroots sometimes from the left, mostly from the right, against the globalist regime that controlled both major parties and all the power structures in the country. And so this was the vision of the show when it got started, that we needed to redefine the right wing by solidifying the political realignment that Donald Trump initiated in 2016 under the banner and under the slogan and under the principles of America First. Famously in the theme song, we quote Donald Trump from his inaugural address when he says, from this day forward, a new vision will govern our land. It is going to be only America first, America first. And the point of my talk tonight is to talk about how this moment in history is the moment of America first. Some have said in history that there is nothing that can stop an idea whose time has come. And America first, the time has come now. Yeah. It is very prescient that last year at our inaugural America first conference, we were coming fresh off of the Groiper War. And I know that a lot of people may not understand what a groiper is, Representative King and Representative Gosar. I'm not sure if they've been initiated into the, gro the groiper subculture. But if you remember, the groiper movement began when America Firsters, such as yourself, young people in college campuses were challenging Turning Point USA, Young America's Foundation, and other conning speakers because they were not sufficiently conservative. They didn't support Trump, and really they had no business identifying as right-wing at all. In fact, they were left-wing. We had last year, and Charlie Kirk has changed his tune a little bit in the time since, 
The last year they were talking about stapling green cards to H-1B visas. And last year, I remember Charlie Kirk said that you could be transgender. There's two genders. You have to pick one. And if you're trans, you could pick the other one. But the guy's okay with transsexual and LGBT. That was last year. And so America First PAC and the Groyper War was a response to what the initial problem was, which is the slide away from the original principles of America First, the slide away from what Donald Trump ran on in 2016, the radical change that was needed, a different position, the different worldview. And so last year, this conference was started in reaction to all of that to provide an answer to CPAC and an answer to Turning Point SAS and an answer, in a word, to Con Inc. And now, just a year later, we see that the same conflict is going national. The same conflict between the conservative establishment and the America First pro-Trump base now has national significance, and it is playing out on a national electoral battlefield. Because what we have witnessed in the past month, of course, is that President Donald Trump has left office, he's been banned from Twitter, and now, and this is something you haven't seen as much yet, but it is coming soon, he is going to face a battery of lawsuits. You're already seeing that in Georgia and in New York. And so Donald Trump is very vulnerable. And this gives an opportunity for the conservative establishment to do what they have wanted to do since he came down the escalator five years ago in June 2015, and that is to remove Trump from the equation and sink their claws back into the Republican Party and wrest back control over this movement from the people, from the populists, and from the nationalists. And you could already see them coalescing. It is people like Nikki Haley. And it's people like Ronna Romney McDaniel. And Mitt Romney. And Tom Cotton. And all the usual suspects, we know. And we've booed them all night. <laughs> we all know. We hate them. They are not conservative. They do not reflect where the base is. And they're lining up, and they are drooling and salivating at the thought that they could take back control of the party from Trump in his moment of vulnerability. And this, to me, is an extension of that same conflict that took place last year. In the same way that it was young people going up to Charlie Kirk or Ben Shapiro or Kimberly Guilfoyle and daring to ask them what actually they're conserving, now all of the 74 million people that voted for Donald Trump have to do the same thing to the Republican Party, the same thing to every Republican running for office in the House and the Senate in 2022 and in 2024 and say, what exactly are you conserving and how actually are you perpetuating the political realignment started by Donald Trump? But the conflict is not this simple. And I know a lot of people understand this. They see Nikki Haley wants to be president. And let me tell you something, Nikki Haley, you're never going to be president. Nobody likes you. <laughs> but everybody understands that the same old ambitious and cynical and corrupt political actors are trying to get back, back in power. I think everybody understands that. Everybody sees the writing on the wall. And so I want to talk about a different aspect of this conflict which has not, I don't think, been discussed enough. If today a referendum were held on who should retain control of the Republican Party, whether that would be the former President Donald Trump or the Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell, who do you think would win that referendum? Of course. And just take a look at the approval ratings. Donald Trump, before the presidential election, had the highest approval rating out of any Republican president in the history of the United States. Yeah. 
Donald Trump was the highest vote getter out of any incumbent, incumbent president in the history of the United States. He increased his share of the vote from 65 million in 2016 to 74 million votes with the voter fraud. And so we know that Donald Trump is the rightful ruler, I like that word, <laughs> leader of the Republican Party. And we could see very simply with the special Senate runoff elections in Georgia that the voters agree. The voters did not turn out for Leffler and Purdue. They did not turn out for a Republican majority in the Senate with these two seats. And so if it comes down to a battle between the overt political establishment like Mitch McConnell and Nikki Haley, and even people like Adam Kinzinger or Liz Cheney, over traitors, explicit enemies of Donald Trump. If it came down to a battle, to a political fight between those establishment forces and us and Donald Trump, I actually don't think it would even be much of a fight at all. It would be a massacre. It would be a total annihilation of the other side. So that's not the fight that they want to happen. What they want to happen is something actually a little bit different. And what made me think of this for this address tonight is something that I saw on Twitter the other day. So I will tell you that America First has been looking across the country at different political races. We're thinking about primarying all of these rhinos that did not stick up for Donald Trump in the aftermath of the 2020 election. And you remember, when I traveled the country and stopped the steal, I said that it doesn't stop with stop the steal. That if Joe Biden is inaugurated, we don't stop after January 20th. We just shift focus. And everybody that was mobilizing and rallying to stop the steal on January 21st, 2021, was going to shift gears and instead move to primary every last rhino in 2022. And when I said that, I meant it. We're going to do that. And so if you take a look across the country at who the most vulnerable Republican incumbents will be in 2022, and this is along the same line as what I just said, the most vulnerable representatives or senators are those that oppose Donald Trump. The most vulnerable races will be Liz Cheney in Colorado. It will be Adam Kinzinger in Illinois. It will be the representatives and senators that have, in fact, been censured by their state and local GOPs for their opposition to Donald Trump. The vulnerability of people that are opposed to Trump speaks to the advantage that Trump has in the coming civil war within the party. But I looked at the district that Adam Kinzinger is running in in 2022, and I saw yesterday, and he's got a new challenger already. Probably most of you don't even know this. Maybe you don't know the name. But yesterday I saw a very clean and slick and professional and nicely edited campaign ad for a woman named Catalina Loff. Okay, so maybe some people know what's going on here. Catalina Loff is 26 years old. She is Latina, and that is good politically. <laughs> Trust me, just take a look at the AFPAC lineup. The more diversity that you have, the less they can call you racist. This is very advantageous, the consultants tell me. So Catalina Loff is a young, pretty Latina, and she will tell you, and believe me, I familiarized myself with some of her literature in just the past day, and it's all over the place, that she is the daughter of legal immigrants from Guatemala. And isn't that, yeah, and isn't that something? Two years ago, she ran in Illinois' 14th district where, or rather four years ago, I believe, she ran in Illinois' 14th district where she lives, and now she's running in the 16th district where Adam Kinzinger is defending his seat, which is kind of interesting, you know? I mean, the election is two years away. We just got done with an election. She's already announced she doesn't live in the district. She just lost a couple of years ago. 
Now we're supposed to rally around this person to defeat Adam Kinzinger. I'll cut to the chase. What stood out to me was her campaign advertisement announcing her candidacy to run for Adam Kinzinger's seat. I'll read you a short quote from it. It says, quote, I'm the daughter of a legal immigrant who moved to Illinois to pursue the American dream, and I'm a small business owner. That's why I love this country, and it's why I'm not afraid to fight for it. It gave my family opportunity. I care about the future of the Republican Party, our values of free enterprise, our God-given individual liberties, and law and order. It's our party now. It's our movement. It's America first. It's America first, is it? And there's some obvious things in here, but let's break down the wording just a little bit. She says, I'm the daughter of a legal immigrant who moved to Illinois to pursue the American dream. Now, what does that mean? A lot of people talk about legal immigration, and this is the popular thing now. This is the cop-out, where you can say, I'm a hardliner on immigration when it comes to illegals, but I'm totally in favor of legal immigration. In my opinion, there's not much of a distinction, really. In any case, we'll get onto that later on in the speech. When we think about people that are triumphantly coming to America as legal immigrants in pursuit of the American dream, what actually does that mean? What does the American dream mean for somebody that comes from Guatemala, whether in a caravan or through an H-1B visa or as a legal immigrant? What does that mean? It means you're an economic migrant, obviously. It means you're somebody who was in a poor country and you moved to a rich, safe, prosperous country and you got a job. And this is called the American dream. If only Americans had the luxury, if only American high school graduates and American college graduates, if only they had the luxury of simply picking up and going to Elysium, going to some place which is much nicer and much fancier and richer and everything so much easier. That dream is unavailable to us. It is only available to people in countries worse than ours. So her ancestors are economic migrants who come here, and she says, and this is the kicker, she says, that's why I love this country. That's why I love this country. I love this country because my parents came here and got a job. Is that an America first attitude? No. That sounds like an immigrant first attitude. That sounds like a me first attitude. I came here, my family came here, it benefited me, it worked out for me, and that's why I love this place. Well, let me tell you a little something about a love for America, and specifically a love for Illinois. I live in Illinois, and it's brutal. The winter is brutal, and the taxes are killer. And the place is totally liberal, it's run by this, I don't know, this cartoon, like a Monsters, Inc. character or something. <laughs> but I live there and I love it because that place is my home. <laughs> I'm from Illinois, too. And my ancestors came to Illinois, too from foreign countries maybe over a hundred years ago, but it's a similar story. And I love my home, and I would love my home even if it had nothing to give me. I would still love my home even if there was nothing directly to benefit from it. And that's... <laughs> that's a situation that we find all of ourselves in right here tonight. Think about what has gone on in this country in the past year and what you, as a young, patriotic, Christian, often white, American, can expect from your country and its institutions. You can expect to be investigated by the FBI. You can expect to be deplatformed on social media. You can expect that your vote will be cast aside and not counted. You can expect that you'll be discriminated against in the hiring process, and in academia when you apply to go for college. You can expect that you'll pay a lot of taxes and get nothing in return. 
And in spite of all of that, we still fight for our country because this is our home. So this Latina doesn't understand anything about love for country, love for America, love for your home, because it's all transactional. I love this country because it worked out for me. That's the message that I get from this. Of course, what is more explicit is what she says the supposedly America First priorities are. She says that the Republican Party values free enterprise, individual liberty, and law and order. That is what the Heritage Foundation values. That is what the American Enterprise Institute values. That is what the super PAC that paid for the advertisement values. And slogans like that and policies like that are little more than window dressing for a pro-business, pro-Wall Street, America last agenda. Yet she says immediately after this, and by the way, not that there's anything wrong with free enterprise and individual liberty and law and order, but that simply does not describe the totality of the problems that we face right now today. We're not suffering at the moment from an excess of licentiousness or permissiveness or things of that nature. What follows, though, from these this declaration of principles is she says, it's our party, it's our movement, it's America first. What party? What movement? What are you talking about? That's not America first. That's the same stuff that Paul Ryan says. That's the same stuff that all the Republicans talk about. And that's not America first. But this is what you're seeing more and more of. You take the same policies and the same substance and the same super PACs and the same donors and think tanks and staffers and all of it, and you slap on the America First slogan, Trump endorses, which is, we love the guy, but this has a tendency to happen. And many people who are of the grassroots in America First, the true zealots, as Michelle said, the true believers in Trump, in this movement, in America First, are suckered into voting for more of the same. And so I pose a very simple question pertinent to this emerging civil war in the party. Who would you rather have in Congress? And this is a tough one. Would you rather have Adam Kinzinger, an overt, an explicit, but an honest traitor and an enemy of Donald Trump and the Republican Party, or would you rather have a snake in the grass, the same old, same old, the same establishment that hates you and hates your family and doesn't care about you and sells you down the river, but calling themselves America first and deluding everybody into getting behind them? It is not a difficult question. And I said this throughout Stop the Steal. I will take any day of the week an enemy over a traitor. And that is what we're seeing more and more of in the GOP. The real danger is not the establishment. The real danger is not the most vulnerable Republican incumbents who are opposed to Trump, like Liz Cheney and Adam Kinzinger and others. The real threat to this movement and to this country and to an authentic right-wing revival in America is the threat of the establishment co-opting this movement in the way that I've just described. I'll give you another example of this from somebody I've talked about on my show before, Madison Cawthorn. Madison Cawthorn, the perfect guy for politics, handsome, tall, wheelchair bound. <laughs> wheelchair bound. You know what I don't understand, and I don't know if this is deliberate, 
I don't know if this is a play on words, but why is this guy always talking about standing up? <laughs> is it just me? Every speech, every tweet, I'm going to take a stand. <laughs> How? <laughs> How are you going to do that? I hope that's not too offensive. It's in good fun. But, but he's the perfect face for politics, and he identifies as America first. On his campaign website, he sets as the frame for his issues page as America first. And among the policies that he lists as America first, it's saber-rattling with Russia and China. It's tax cuts. It's an end to illegal immigration, but not legal immigration. But I want to point to specifically a little excerpt from an article that he wrote for the Daily Wire last year. The title of the article is, America Needs a New Republican Party. Well, this is promising. <laughs> I'm sure if you share that headline with your boomer relatives or friends and you see a character like this, somebody who is a good speaker and handsome and optical and the right look and everything like that, talking about a new Republican Party, you might get your hopes up. Well, let me read you the article because I agree there should be a new Republican Party. He writes, quote, in a flawed and imperfect two-party system, the Republican Party represents America's best hope of saving this nation and preserving Republican principles of liberty and limited government. For the past two decades, however, the Republican Party has marginalized principled reformers in its own ranks and let itself be branded as the party of no on things such as health care, the environment, and other key issues, our leadership has aggressively attacked ideas from the left, but has failed to force consensus around the best ideas from the right. Now let's pause for a second. When you think about the principled reformers in the Republican Party, like Representative Gosar or Representative Steve King, When you think about the principled reformers who have been pushed back and gatekept and destroyed by the Republican Party, are they being pushed back because they're proposing a market-based solution to climate change? Are they being pushed out because they're proposing a market-based alternative to Obamacare? No. They're being pushed out because they support this country having borders. They are being pushed out because they want an end to America last wars in the Middle East for foreign interests. They are being pushed out because they're talking about the real problems in the country, not this stuff. He goes on and it gets better. It says, it wasn't always this way. And if we want to be a credible party in the future that can win national elections, that trend cannot continue. Our party ought not to be ashamed of its heritage, nor be afraid of open debate and challenging the woke left just not challenging the woke right, though, right? Which they never do. He says on race, Senator Tim Scott is right and wise. Right and wise. Tim Scott. To remind conservatives that unjust racial bias is real and persistent. As Scott, who is black, as if anybody could be allowed to forget that for even a second, as Scott, who is black, notes, he knows what it's like to be pulled over to be stopped by security in the Capitol because of the color of his skin. We've come a long way, but Scott is right to remind Republicans that we have a long way to go. Let us rise as a new Republican Party, a party that offers real solutions and attacks ideas rather than individuals. This is our new Republican Party. The new Republican Party is the party of climate change, universal health care, and Black Lives Matter, apparently, according to Madison Cawthorn. But see, he calls it America first. This is the real threat to the party. This is the real threat to the movement. Because when you run on a platform like this, you get destroyed. No chance. Like Leffler and Purdue in the future, like Cheney and like Adam Kinzinger, they do not stand a chance against the juggernaut that is America First and Donald Trump. But if those people 
disguise themselves as America First with the same stuff, it is going to suck out all the money and all the energy and the attention and the momentum right out of the room and direct it right back into the same establishment that got us in this place in the first place. So it is important tonight to return to fundamentals. If Madison Cawthorn is not America first, if Catalina Loff is not America first, then we have to ask ourselves and define what is America first? What does that really mean? These are slogans that are thrown around so much and by so many people and with such regularity that it's lost its meaning, like many other words in politics, but it doesn't have to. Before we define what America first is, we first have to define what America is. And you may think that this is a semantic exercise, but this is important because not everybody agrees. At the conference across the way at CPAC, and I'm, <laughs> boo. <laughs> and at Turning Point USA and Young America's Foundation, America is merely an idea. And it doesn't matter how many immigrants you bring over here. It doesn't matter what language this country speaks. It doesn't matter if this country even is on this continent. They say that as long as you have the Constitution and these liberal enlightenment values that you've got America, I'm here to tell you tonight that that is not true. It's not true. America, put simply, is a particular people in a particular place. It is really that simple. We are the Americans, and America is the home of the Americans. That's what it means to be America. America is one people, one nation on this continent forged over hundreds of years by shared experiences, descended from an English cultural framework and influenced by European civilization. America is a Christian nation. that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and this is one nation under that God. Say his name. So if America ceases to be this people, if America ceases to retain that English cultural framework, and the influence of European civilization, if it loses its white demographic core, and if it loses its faith in Jesus Christ, then this is not America anymore. And that's got nothing to do with rights. That's got nothing to do with your right to smoke pot and get gay married or anything like that. <laughs> so if that is America, then America first is simply the interests and the well-being of the Americans and their country put first. Put first before the regime that rules this country and their profits and their power. Put first before foreign countries, our allies, like Japan, and NATO, and Israel, and Saudi Arabia. Put first before our rivals, like Russia, China, Iran, and North Korea. Put first before multinational corporations and the billionaire class. Put first before the dogma of free market capitalism.
It means the well-being and the interest and the good of the flesh and blood American people in this place first. Every time, always, before everything else, and not one single exception. And the right-wing movement has to be America first because of the current predicament that we find ourselves in. We have got to separate out and divorce in our minds America, as I've just described it, from the American regime. The American regime, which consists of elite media, Hollywood, academia, the deep state, the national security apparatus, the billionaire class, big business, big pharma, big tech, big agriculture, big energy. We have got to separate out the people in this country that are the country from those outsiders, the interlopers and imposters, the evil people that now rule this country. It's got to be separated. The people that have built this system, this sick, evil, corrupt system, reject the very existence of America. They reject the existence of the nations. The people that constitute the elite can be various dis variously described as post-national, transnational, anti-national. They reject the idea that there even are nations. What they pursue and what they want to achieve is total globalization. The erasure of borders and the legal jurisdiction of the government, the erasure of the national economy of the United States and its national sovereignty, and the erasure of its population. They are pursuing, to put it simply, three kinds of globalization. The globalization of the population through mass immigration globalization of the economy through free trade, and the globalization of the government through global government under the pretext of universal global threats, made up threats, like climate change, white supremacy, and recently the COVID pandemic. So this is the real battlefield. This is the struggle and the fight and the war that we have been plunged into. It is not a battle to stave off socialism in America. Sorry, but somebody has to say that. It's not a battle between conservatives and liberals, capitalists and socialists. It is a battle between the globalist American regime and the people that they rule, the Americans, the populists, and the nationalists, the America firsters. That's the only paradigm that describes the world we live in and its problems right now. This is the political realignment that I'm describing. This is what must occur. And when you've got a Madison Cawthorn, a Dan Crenshaw, a Catalina Luff coming around and calling themselves America first while still pretending that we're fighting the socialist squad, while still coming up with this language about free enterprise and our individual liberties, we have got to recognize that folks, they just don't get it. They don't get what's going on here, and they're not America first. That is what it means to be America first. Now, there is also a new cadre of people that are coming around that are even seeking to co-opt the message that we're talking about. They're a little bit more faithful to the substance of what I'm describing. Some people like Josh Hawley and some others, they use words like industrial policy. That's one of their antidotes to the problems going on in the country. And I've got to tell you, I look around at what's going on in the country, and it's a total nightmare. I wake up every day and wish I could go back to sleep sometimes. It seems like every passing day, it's worse than ever before, and that continues to be true every other day. But having said that, with all these things going on, we need a real reaction with an attitude of what we're experiencing. 
I'm sorry, but when I see Black Lives Matter destroying the city, I want to say certain things. You know, hey, you know what kind of guy I am, nothing bad. John, John Miller, my African-American over there. When I get kicked off an airplane, as I did a couple of months ago, for not wearing a mask, I've got to say certain things that have gotten me banned from a few airlines. And, you know, somehow industrial policy or multiracial working class populism just doesn't do the trick. Just doesn't suffice. Frankly, they are gay, and... <laughs> and we are based. When I see what's going on in the country, I don't want to listen to some of these five-hour podcasts about policymaking. I want to get in front of somebody and say, it's America first, bitch. it has to be. What you're seeing happen with some of these characters is the same thing that they're doing with Donald Trump. They say, we want Trumpism without Trump. So what they're saying is they want the platinum plan, and they want the corporate tax cuts, and they want the continuation of the wars in the Middle East, and the $700 billion budget for the Defense Department without the border wall. They want that without the Muslim ban. They want it without Kofefi. And they want it without the tweets. And they want it without the personality and the gusto. But, and to get serious, it is those things that differentiate us from them. When I see Donald Trump go on the timeline on Twitter and he goes off, when I see him get on the podium and just start saying things, Ted Cruz's dad killed JFK and... <laughs> The World Trade Center came down under your brother. That's not keeping us safe. When he says things like this, it reminds us that he is a real human being. It reminds us, it reminds us that he is one of us. Maybe more than that Trump is one of us, certainly he has a lifestyle that none of us could imagine. It shows us that he's not one of them more than anything. Because these people that are grown in a petri dish in a laboratory in the Heritage Foundation, they would never say something like that. They would never give the speech that I'm giving. They would never tweet the things Trump has tweeted. And that is because they have been groomed for power by the same establishment that we're fighting against. So they can't fight it. They are it. They are of it. And they are that establishment. So that's why America First has got to have that attitude. That is what America First means. That's America. That's the situation we find ourselves in. If we're to talk about the essence of politics, so to speak, that is the us versus them distinction. And the main issues that America First traffics in, by the way, are not free enterprise and individual liberty and things like that. The main issues that America First must solve and seeks to solve are issues of sovereignty. Fundamentally, the crisis of our time is a crisis of control over our country. Donald Trump said in 2016, this election will determine whether we're a free nation or whether we have only the illusion of democracy but are in fact controlled by a small handful of global special interests rigging the system. That is the referendum that we're facing right now. 
The sovereignty issues of our time are simple. Immigration first. Big tech censorship. Voter fraud, the COVID lockdown. And I think going along with that too is the anti-white agenda of the mainstream media. So let's take immigration for starters. Every time an immigrant comes into this country, let's think about it this way. Rather than uh, another apple being created, and rather than them coming over here and, I don't know, saluting the flag or something like that, every time immigrants come over here, they are necessarily diluting the economic, social, and political power of every Native American that lives here. This is how we have to view immigration. It is a challenge to the power and the influence and the sovereignty, the sovereignty of the Native Americans that live here. As far as big tech censorship is concerned, we've been warning people about that for a long time. Of course, we've got Laura Loomer in attendance. She probably knows it better than anybody. In fact, I'm sure she does. And there are lots of people in this room too, myself included, and everybody at that table who's experienced it as well. And I'm sure there's a not insignificant number of groipers out here on Twitter who experienced that too. Without access to the means of mass media and massive communication, any kind of political movement is impossible. This is what democracy is dependent on, is the media and finance infrastructure that keeps afloat all of the electoral systems and the elections. If we don't have access to those means of communication, we are effectively outside of the electoral process. If you cannot run campaign advertisements, if you cannot spread your political message, if you can't send out an email list or a mass text or get people to follow you on Twitter, you can't run for office, you certainly can't win, and you cannot participate in the governance of this country. It's a sovereignty issue. And then finally, I want to talk about the issue of anti-white toxicity, as Michelle put it aptly in the mainstream media. Specifically, I want to talk about it in the context of the Black Lives Matter riots last year. If anybody could look at what conservatives said last year in the wake of the George Floyd riots and not find it woefully insufficient at best, treacherous at worst, then you're probably in Black Lives Matter. Because the Republican response to cities being burned to the ground, the response to statues of our ancestors and heroes being torn down, the response to new holidays being created and old ones discarded, and the creation, and don't forget this, the creation of a new racial caste system in this country with whites at the bottom, if your reaction to all of that is to say, Black Lives Matter doesn't really care about black lives, if your reaction to all of that is to say, what does burning down Minneapolis do for black people in the south side of Chicago? If your response to that is to say that BLM is just too violent or not moderate enough, then you are a traitor to the United States of America. Because what BLM is doing is they are challenging the very existence of the United States of America as it is, and the historic American nation. This challenge to the existence of our country must be matched and exceeded with equal ferocity and intensity in defense of America. And I know some people aren't going to like me saying this. I'm sure you all are going to love what I'm about to say, but people watching at home are not, some of them are not going to like this. It's controversial. Well, it's really, it's true, but it's something that you can't say anymore. White people 
founded this country. This country wouldn't exist without white people. And white people are done being bullied. We're not asking for anything that is not afforded to every other group of people in this country. We're not asking, we demand the dignity and the respect that we deserve. We are living in a multiracial society, and we will live in a multiracial society, but it is only going to work if everybody is respected, everybody is treated with dignity, everybody is afforded the same rights under the law as everybody else. That applies to everyone. And so this is a sovereignty issue because, as I said, it is an attack on America as it exists and on its demographic core. If you are not America first on these issues, if you are not America first on immigration, on big tech, if you cannot stand up to Black Lives Matter, if you don't support Trump, and if you're not against voter fraud, then simply you are not America first, and you have no right calling yourself America first. This last thing I'm going to say, I didn't plan on saying, I didn't want to say it. My lawyers would advise me not to, but I've got to say it. As you know, I was in Washington, D.C. on January 6th, on that fateful day, and we've now learned as the facts have come out that what happened on that day may not have been exactly what we thought it was or what has been presented. We know that people that planned to be there were informed by the FBI the morning of the event. We know now that leaders of the most prominent groups involved in the Capitol siege were headed up by federal informants and federal agents. We now know that the story of a police officer, Brian Sicknick, being beat to death with a fire extinguisher was a fabrication. And so, as always, things are a little bit more complicated than they first seem. All of that being said, when I was there in D.C., outside of the building, and I saw hundreds of thousands of patriots surrounding the U.S. Capitol building, and I saw the police retreating, and we heard that the politicians voting on the fraudulent election had scurried in their underground tunnels away from the Capitol, I said to myself, this is awesome. I don't know about you, but we have been beat up betrayed and spit on and stepped on for decades. And to see the tables turn for once was a little bit refreshing, actually. So that, I don't know how to make a phone call to my lawyer. We'll see if that's okay. But it's true, and I can't pretend that it's not. And I don't know how anybody else could feel any other way. In the aftermath of the riot, they said it was an attack on the sacred temple of democracy. Does anybody believe this? People don't believe this on the right. They don't believe it on the left. The Capitol building and the district, the capital of this country, they are the seat and they are the capital of an evil empire. An evil empire spreading its tentacles around the world and oppressing everything that's good. And so to see that capital under siege 
to see the people of this country rise up and mobilize to D.C. with the pitchforks and the torches. We need a little bit more of that energy in the future. USA, 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 USA. And I say energy because, of course, I disavow all violence, I disavow all vandalism. I respect the government is sovereign over us. Yes, yes. We're not trying to do, you know, we're not going to do anything more. You know, we're doing AFPAC and then I think we're all going to go home, okay? You know, so. All right, I think that'll stand up in court. So I said, let the court record show. I said, energy, not more, I said, more energy, and I disavow violence. But it is true that when I saw that happen that day, I thought to myself that what that showed, real, fake, catalyzed by bad actors, that people showed up and the scenes from inside, the lectern mischievously being stolen, baked Alaska, live streaming. does come down to that. Baked Alaska, the mischief, the laugh, the twinkle in the eye. This is what America is all about. How was this country founded? Was this country founded by following the rules and going with the program and all of that? I think not. I think we're the keepers of the American tradition. And I think our ancestors smile on us right now and what we're doing. Can they say the same? And so I saw all of that lighthearted mischief at the Capitol. <laughs> and I thought to myself that America is not dead. I want to live in an America where something like that is still possible. Because that says to me that that longing for freedom and the ability to rebel, if not just because it's funny <laughs> or fun, that our heart still beats with that same energy. That shows us that this country and this people Americans and America are not dead. They're not going anywhere. If it comes down to America first versus the establishment, we know who will win. The only chance that they have to succeed is through subversion, disinformation, only by redefining, misdirecting, and hijacking America first can they defeat America first. That's the power of what we've started. They know it's what the people want. They know that this idea's time has come, and that's the only way that they can answer it. I want to close with a quote from the Bible, from Matthew 10:16. Because this is what we have to do. Jesus Christ tells his disciples, I am sending you out like sheep, sheep, among wolves. Therefore, be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. This is how we have to be. Because we are sheep among wolves. And this is a theme that I talked about throughout Stop the Steal. If you take a look at the interests arrayed against us, there is no shortage of them. They have limitless resources. They have all the connections, and they wield all the levers of power. The FBI, the CIA, the NSA, DHS, and the deep state, the Federal Reserve, Wall Street, academia, media, Hollywood, big tech. They've got it all, except for one thing. We have God on our side in this struggle.
We have God on our side. And we are the flock and the sheep among the wolves and among the snakes and among the evil people and the high spiritual places in the world, but we have the protection of God and the protection of Jesus. And when we think about what must be done and what's going to happen in the next four years in our lifetimes, all we have to do is think about how are we serving God. It's that simple. We don't have to come up, well, I mean, I'll have to come up with grand strategies and plans, but all that each and every one of us has to be concerned with simply is doing your best to do what's right. If you ever think that it's a tall order, if you ever think that it's too intimidating or impossible, Jesus doesn't ask for the impossible. He doesn't ask for the impossible from you. He just asks for you to do everything that you can to do his will. And if each and every person in this room, and myself included, and everybody watching at home is doing everything in their power to set things straight, then we don't have to worry. It's in God's hands, and that is all that anybody can do. And ultimately, in the end, as we know, we know how this story ends, God has the final victory. Remember that. So to close the second annual America First Political Action Conference, I want to say emphatically and definitively that this is the real America First movement and we are inevitable. Thank you. Yeah.